brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechats.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chat. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. This is the way, Higher Side Chatters. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and I would say that I hope your seat backs and tray tables are in the upright lock position. But we both know you're not allowed to fly anywhere, so we will contemplate the mysteries of reality while we still can, even as the green paper chase and high-octane fear porn news cycles seek to occupy all of our attention. And some of those great mysteries are an understanding of reality's true paradigm, humanity's place in it, and what to make of strange encounters with more highly advanced forms of intelligent life. What really is the difference between an alien and an angel, a fairy or a demon, a ghost or an orb of conscious plasma? With the vast variance we have across the spectrum of high strangeness, can we even say it's one thing? And when we see the deep level involvement of military intelligence and MK Ultra adjacent consciousness science, the possibilities get even weirder. But needless to say, many people are seeing and communicating with something unexplainable and have been for quite some time. Are they from space, some other dimension, a vast and hidden world beneath our feet, or projections from the deep and dark corners of our own unexplored mind? Well, these are the questions we will surely find a conclusive answer to today with returning guest Isaac Weissop. You probably remember Isaac from our past episodes exploring his previous books like Sacrifice, Magic Behind the Mic, which takes a deep and disturbing look at occult activity within the music industry, or that other time we explored the esoteric themes in Star Wars and the works of the true rulers of the universe, the Disney Corporation, covered in his book, The Star Wars Conspiracy. But he has been super busy churning out all sorts of great stuff in recent years, including his book and companion DVD for Kubrick's Code, an examination of Illuminati and occult symbolism in Stanley Kubrick's films, his 2017 title, The Dark Path, Conspiracy Theories of the Illuminati and Occult Symbolism in Pop Culture, The New Age Alien Agenda and Satanic Transhumanism. Another book released earlier this year that takes the best from his great podcast, which shares the same name, Conspiracy Theories and Unpopular Culture. And the main offering on the THC altar today, his latest release, Aliens, UFOs, and the Occult, Use Your Illusion Part 1, UAP Disclosure, Spiritual Warfare, and Manifesting Extraterrestrials Through Entertainment. He does more in a year than I do in five, so bend the knee for the dark world deep diver extraordinaire, the Christian conspiracy crusader, the Illuminati agenda illuminator, Isaac Weissop. It's been too long. Welcome back, man. <laughs> man, all bow down to the great conspiracy podcast king, Greg Carwood. Man, that's a great intro, dude. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me back on here again. Oh, of course. It is a real pleasure, man. I know you focused on some serious stuff on your podcast and your previous work, and it can get quite dark. But I do look at your back catalog, and I'm reminded of the good old days when we could speculate about Kubrick helping them film the moon landing on a soundstage and seeding clues in his movies, or we could look at the pattern of celebrities who had a close friend or relative die somewhat mysteriously right before their career really took off with the full weight of the industry behind them. Just good, wholesome conspiracy fun, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and like the sort of mantra has been is, you know, make conspiracies theory again. Like this whole year has been just so much. And yeah, there is some level of 
it being more light and fun when it's not so much in your face and real world consequences and these tough decisions and you know everyone's got to be an online doctor now and a lawyer and re <laughs> we're all researching these these ideas of the unfolding agenda that is happening at an accelerating rate which is what led me to honestly pick up the alien theme because for years I've been, you know, back in 2017, I wrote The Dark Path, which was my kind of attempt at revealing the occult agenda hidden behind entertainment. And as part of that agenda, there was a couple chapters where we talked about aliens and UFOs and all this stuff. And in the book, I relayed the idea that NASA and the powers that be will eventually be disclosing that aliens exist and we've been in contact. And the argument to me back then was that there was a religious or spiritual element to that. Now, fast forward to 2020, and I had been working on an alien book for several months. I just didn't have, I go through these like periods of, of writer's block because like you mentioned, you know, I run a podcast and all this other stuff. So I'm pretty busy. And I thought, man, I really got to get this alien book done. Because to me, I think, and this is going to be a sort of zoomed out 50,000 foot perspective, but I think that clearly we're going through something that is being utilized for what they call the Great Reset. And the ideas behind the Great Reset, right from the, the words of Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum's orchestrator here, you know, they talk a lot about America needing to be no longer the world's superpower. Like they need to sort of bring down. America as this sort of beacon of democracy because they truly want some kind of sort of Marxist utopia of redistribution. And they have these noble causes of protecting the planet and taking care of the poorest among us and all that stuff. But to me, I think that they want this great reset. If we do not fall for this sort of idea and buy into it, that the next stage, the next part of the agenda is the alien UFO disclosure movement, which is clearly happening. I mean, it's from the voices of these great, you know, thought leaders in the UFO world, ufologists. I mean, even the Pentagon is doing this. I mean, this is all very much happening. This UFO disclosure movement that they're rebranding as the UAP disclosure, which is propaganda 101 to rebrand the terms. But anyway. <laughs> I think that if they can't get their goals achieved through what's happening this year, that the alien agenda will in fact make it happen. As President Ronald Reagan said this many years ago at the United Nations, he said something to the effect of like, you know, what it would take to bring the world together. And he was referring to sort of a global government, which, you know, not to get into politics, but Reagan, he was a member of some of these groups that believed in a globalist government. Mm hmm. So that's why I hurried up and wrote this first book, because as you alluded to, there's a part one and part two I'm working on still. And I originally wanted to do both, releasing both the same day. And as the title alludes to, an homage to the Guns N' Roses double album. But to me, the agenda is heating up too fast, too quick. And I wanted to get this first book out there to try to start waking people up to this idea. Yes. We are in thick and heavy times, but it is all part of the story. And to get more into this latest book, which I liked a lot, you waste no time. The very first sentence reads, The shift is imminent. Alien disclosure is the next phase of a larger agenda that promises to fulfill an occult fantasy that is hundreds of years in the making. <laughs> and there is no question that we've had more quote unquote disclosures coming from military intelligence lately. But talk to us about how alien disclosure would fulfill this occult fantasy of which you speak. Yeah, I'm very passionate about this kind of thing because through the years that I've been doing this sort of research into conspiracies, the Illuminati, the occult, all these sort of things. And before this year, like you mentioned earlier, it was almost of minimal consequence. Like we could talk about the moon landing being faked on Kubrick's movie and it's just a good time and it's a fun thought exercise. But to me, I try to keep my subjective opinions out of the theories, or at least I try to present them as such that here's the part that I find 
interesting, but I don't necessarily get behind. And then there's parts where I'm like, oh, this is happening. Like the Great Reset, for example. Like I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> that's happening. Yeah. Um, and this alien agenda is to me up there, you know, with fact of the matter. Alistair Crowley, he wrote a book called Magic Without Tears. And he said that extraterrestrials are the only chance for mankind to advance as a whole through alien contact. All of these occultists, ancient aliens, right? They always talk about this stuff. Helena Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy, she talked about the integrated ascended masters, such as Ashtar, that were channeling information to the initiates. Dr. Puhar and Yuri Geller were out there talking to the nine these aliens that were giving them information, which, oh, by the way, the Bronfman family was involved with for a period of time, who are now infamous for being connected to Nexium, the sex cult there. I mean, we can go on all day. Like, I've got all these different influential occultists of history and how they all were making contact with aliens or extraterrestrials or interdimensional entities or ultra terrestrials. I mean, whatever you want to call this thing, this phenomenon happening, it all goes back to these occult thought leaders who believed that we need to change the world through enlightenment of mankind. You know, you go back to John D and Edward Kelly, right? Queen Elizabeth. She was using them to garner information from the alien spirits which they then wrote the Enochian language, which was then used by Aleister Crowley for the Amelantra workings, which he used in you know 1917 to channel the first gray alien. And the list goes on and on. So to me, when I say they want to fulfill this fantasy, the listener has to understand that my perspective of the world, self-admittedly, this has been at least 10 years that I've been really digging into the occult doctrine the esoteric philosophies. And what I like to do is try to reveal their presence inside of pop culture and entertainment. Because to me, that's entertaining. That's fun. Because some of this material, when you try to read these books, they're very difficult to read. They're very difficult to understand. And it's almost like there's hidden messages within the textbooks, which would make sense, right? You look at the history of all the ancient mystery schools and secret societies. It wasn't intended for everyone necessarily to understand. It was only those initiates deemed worthy. But the curious thing is that in the late 1800s, Victorian era times, Helena Blavatsky was kind of one of the first occultists to start revealing this idea to the masses in her books. And then Crowley sort of pushed it a bit further, proclaiming the new age, the Aeon of Horus. But to me, when you research all of these thought leaders of the occult, they ultimately say, look, we've been in contact with these entities, and, and you can fill in the blank, like I said, with whatever you want to call these things. We've been in contact with these things for hundreds of years. And to me, I'm concerned about that. Are these <laughs> are, are these people like Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons, who called himself the Antichrist, are they going to pull in some satanic forces some dark entities some luciferian spirits you know are they going to pull something like that into our world and i could be persuaded to either side of this argument are they angels are they demons i don't to me it depends it could be both i mean what do we know <laughs> uh, my concern is that i think the masses are being brought into this thing that is a psychological component and that energy will be used by these sort of sorcerers of Atlantis that are out there trying to channel these entities. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And I have the same concerns. And that is why I like talking to someone like you, because we speculate about a lot of the same things. And we also probably have some different conclusions, which is, I think, what makes a conversation fun is that we don't agree on necessarily every angle or what to emphasize. And I also get the desire to focus on Hollywood because really the, the more I learn about the power of manifestation, the more important I think it is to really realize that there's a lot of power in capturing that many minds to focus on a particular thing. And you can definitely inject themes through Hollywood that probably can manifest in reality. And that's 
probably in the mix when it comes to the alien thing. But, you know, I've also talked to other guests who have researched adjacent paranormal pockets of material that actually overlay with aliens quite well, like fairy folklore, because you check all the boxes. There's gift exchange, there's missing time, there's stories of them stealing babies, there's elf shot, which is like the ability to paralyze a person. And there's also stories where Irish kids have seen leprechauns that tell them, hey, uh, you have the genetics to see me and other people can't see me. And that gets really weird. But I think there's a, a real deep overlay the further you go back with what we used to call fairy lore, little green people, and this alien thing. So I don't really know where to start the story. Obviously, you put a heavy emphasis on the occultists who definitely have another huge overlap. I just interviewed Chris Bledsoe, who says he's visited by angels, but some of his stories involve things flying off the shelf. Well, what is that? That sounds like ghost hunting to me. So it, it gets really weird. And this is the, the Venn diagram that I love to try to piece apart. And one other example of that when it comes to your work is the human alien hybrid program. Obviously, a lot of people talk about that in conspiracy culture. And interestingly, you put this in the same realm as the Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard, Babylon working and Crowley's moon child ritual. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can see it. Can you elaborate on some of the similarities there? Sure, sure. Yeah. And let me sort of, I'll zoom out for a bit until we dive deeper because some of these topics like, and that's kind of how I wrote the book was I wanted to kind of like pull people into the funnel before we went down to the bottom of the rabbit hole because it <laughs> sounds insane, right? But to me, I think people have to understand, and, and I would assume the audience is generally on board with us, right? Like yeah. there's entities, there's spirits, there's things in another dimension that exist. So to me, I didn't want to focus on that with this book because I thought, you know, we don't need another UFO book of every case that happened. They're scary ghost stories to me. Those are campfire stories. Like, I don't need that. I don't want that. I'm ready to take this to the next level. Mm -hmm. And the ideas specifically to make that even further of a niche for me is that because I always focus on entertainment and occult philosophies, my idea is that is entertainment driving symbols and sigils into the mass subconscious, whether you want to call that the collective unconscious are they are they are they driving these thoughts and ideas and symbols and archetypes to the subconscious of the masses in order to manifest them on a massive magic ritual and the reason i talk about that is because like i believe aliens exist i don't know how to describe what they are clearly i don't know that answer nobody does right mm -hmm. but i believe in them in the same way i believe in ghosts like i've done some ghost hunting and I've received some very strange like messages and I did mm. enough that I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. We're definitely making contact with some kind of intelligence, some kind of other level of consciousness. You know, and I read John Keel's book, the name escapes me of the, the title, but he talks about the ultra terrestrials and he basically is saying, look, the fairies, the Bigfoot, the aliens, all these things are connected. It's perhaps some kind of entity in another dimension that can pop into our world. And my uneducated thesis is I think that some people are trying to pop these things into our world through mass consciousness, through focus. Because I do believe that ritual magic works. I do believe in thoughts and intentions having real manifestation. Now, you mentioned earlier about my Christian background and that's I've long had this fascination with the dark arts. I was raised as a Christian, you know, and I'm more, I don't want to say agnostic. That's not really a fair description, but like, I'm pretty open-minded that maybe not everything in my belief system is accurate. Maybe there's elements of a control system there, all that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but ultimately it's like, well, technically Jesus Christ himself was an extraterrestrial. He was not of this world. So like, I'm open for a discussion on it. Right. And that's why when, when people have a hard time trying to get behind the idea that aliens exist, I feel like I'm, I and you and, and the audience, we're way past that because these people are locked into like a five senses 
reality and they want proof of aliens through the five senses through a scientific method and it's not really going to work out that way these are kind of interdimensional jacques valet who knows so much about this stuff he said that we're not dealing with people from outer space we're dealing with a control system and he said that this would have an impact with society and it would create a desire for space travel a desire for pursuit of the paranormal and new frontiers in consciousness he wrote this many years ago and that's exactly what we're getting if you watch television while well, these shows about like the ghost hunting and the ghost adventures and i go through several examples of of disney shows through the history channel that support the same agenda of you know ancient aliens and skinwalker ranch and all that stuff and the list goes on and on so to me it seems like most of us are already on board with this but they need to get the masses behind it and that is what the overall disclosure agenda is about it's about trying to get everyone else on board with this thing mhm mm mhm mm and i also think it's to frame it as a threat so they can expand military budgets and military power to a degree potentially but this is the stuff i like to speculate about and i do agree that if contact is going to be made they want it to be their form of contact highly controlled and potentially even simulated you mentioned that the Phoenix Lights might have been an early test of some kind of blue beam adjacent stuff. And that's interesting. See, I guess I, I see layers. I see an elite that thought they were the top rung of the ladder and then realized, oh shit, there's something else out there and we don't have power over it. Uh-oh. So in my mind, they're trying to study it and recreate those same techniques to a degree. But I do love that kind of Jacques Vallée stuff, the idea of a control system or a schedule of reinforcement. But I guess my thought is that at that layer, what they're seeing is it seems like something much older or something outside of the control of the elite. And I'm seeing the elite trying to simulate a parallel program to something that has probably existed for a long, long time, longer than America's existed, longer than the CIA's existed. So I, st I still am left guessing, but if the UFOs are part of a control system of some kind, whose is it, do you think? Is there more than one control system being implemented through the idea of the paranormal and encounters with something else? The idea of it being a control system, which you know Jacques Vallée infamously said it was a control system, you know, it's a very strange idea that, again, unsatisfying answer here for you, but I'm with you on the sense that it only makes sense that in our patriarchal, pro-military sort of country where might is right, of course, we wouldn't have the humility to come out and say to the American public, like, oh, uh, by the way, there's these aliens. We don't really know much about it. Don't be alarmed. We're not really sure what they want or where they come from or how to handle it if they attack us. They feel like they can't share that information with us because that's sort of the mentality of what that represents, what that embodies, that sort of patriarchal powers of Mars and the god of war kind of stuff. So on one hand, I kind of get where they're coming from because their mentality is you can't trust the masses. I mean, look at how we handled the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, right? But I, I would argue that those are the minority of people because I'd prefer to have the actual information myself and I don't want to be tied to the weakest link. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So on one hand, I think that they've got their reasons for why they've kept the secret for so long. And I think that over time, they've been slowly indoctrinating us through entertainment to try to like, casually reveal this truth to the masses without the hysteria as many of those brookings institute report and all that stuff we're talking about and warning about but the thing that's unsatisfying to me is like okay so these things exist we'll say they exist what are they here to do where do they come from and to me i think you can't discredit the idea that much like how when we die, the soul goes into like another dimension of some kind. I think that the aliens are some kind of interdimensional thing 
angelic, demonic, whatever you may believe, it's some kind of form of energy. And I think that my concern is that these could be demonic deceptions, like coming at it from a Christian perspective. I'm concerned that there is a desire to evolve mankind, as all of these occultists have said, and the evolution and the enlightenment of mankind will ultimately come from these aliens, which I would argue it's not going to be this black and white, you know, UFO craft lands on the White House lawn, out comes the alien, the alien says, hey, everyone, here's your formula for free energy. Like, that's not the way this is going to look. And on some levels, that makes sense because a further evolved species would go through the progression that we ourselves as a human species are going through. We're going from the human form to the transhuman form, which as you can see through the works of science fiction that, like I argue in the book, ultimately become reality through, you know, <laughs> I call them the science nerds. The science nerds are obsessing over the science fiction and they're like, they want to make that a reality. And, and this has happened for a hundred years now. But they will ultimately make us into uh, digital consciousness. Like that's the progression. So if you advance, you know, a thousand years down the road, the you know Homo sapiens sapiens will no longer exist. It'll be some kind of form of digital consciousness, and that's what I think the aliens, their presence will be. It's not going to be detectable through the five senses. It's going to rely on some kind of interpretation material, like. No different than like an x-ray machine or an ultrasound machine. You're quite literally going beyond the five, the limited senses into the frequency spectrum further out from what we can detect and relying on a machine to give us the knowledge, the wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to tie it into the Luciferian idea, I mean, look at Jack Parsons, right? This is a guy who followed Crowley. He, was, he wrote a whole book uh, called uh, The Antichrist. He said, look, I'm the Antichrist. I'm here to destroy Christianity. You know, Crowley, again, they call it the lying hypocrisy of Christianity. Blavatsky, Bailey, all these occultists, they seem to think that the real thing holding back all of human progress is Christianity, not so much the other religions, which is kind of what you see on the Ancient Aliens show when uh, they seem to embrace Hinduism to all lengths and extents, but like, Christianity always gets the bad rep. Like, that's the real problem here. And that's what all these occultists are saying quite literally in their works. Well, I would say Judaism and Islam also uh, don't necessarily get the best PR in, in modern <laughs> society, especially Judaism when it comes to the conspiracy culture. But I get what you're saying, that it comes from the occultists. That seems to be their focus. And a lot of this is about philosophy and interpretations. And just like the entities themselves, I think there's a broad spectrum of beings. But I'm not surprised that the ones that play ball with the invisible college and military intelligence are probably darker entities. It's like that Israeli intelligence guy who came out a few weeks ago and said, oh, yeah, we work with the aliens we have a moon base with the aliens, or actually I think he said they have a Mars base where they work with the aliens, mm -hmm. and the aliens have asked us not to reveal them because you're not ready. We want to reveal them, but they asked us to keep it a secret because humanity's not ready, and it's like, oh, okay, so they only want to work with psychopaths and military generals. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense unless they're a certain uh, type of entity, but this really gets to kind of the heart of the things in your book that I would say I probably disagree with or just have a different take about. And I don't want to get hung up on our different worldviews, but you mentioned that in the book Secret Machines that Peter Lavenda wrote with Tom DeLong, they spend an odd amount of time explaining Gnosticism, which is odd. I do agree that you went to read a book about aliens and you have this long diatribe about, about uh, a religious philosophy that doesn't seem like it's that connected. But uh, of course, Gnosticism does flip the script on Christianity pretty much 180 degrees, but in my limited understanding, I see Gnosticism as a philosophy of empowerment in the sense that the Demiurge and the elite are both conspiring to make this physical reality seem dense and heavy and immutable. They promote a victim mentality. You have no control. 
But reality is actually quite pliable if you actually engage with the natural world over the simulated culture of economics and the paper chase and all that. Grimoires are instructions for making weird forms of contact, but they would burn you for looking at that. And they burned a lot of those books themselves. Psychedelics and indigenous plant medicines can also show you other worlds, but they will lock you in a cage if they catch you at those. Even stuff like remote viewing, intention healing, astral travel, to me this stuff is intentionally put down from the mainstream culture, not encouraged. So Gnosticism says that the physical reality is an illusion. Well, it, it kind of is when you look at some of these mental phenomenon. Gnosticism says there's no authority but the self. You have to explore the boundaries of the world rather than accept some authority's explanation. It feels to me like the inner calling to explore this sandbox reality is what the elite want to snuff out and say, nothing to see here. You are stuck in this physical world and you better just make some money. But I guess that's not how you see it. And and also, I, I acknowledge that a philosophy can't be judged based on one interpretation. We can obviously look at Christianity's history and see a lot of bad interpretations of the message. And I also think with Gnosticism, yeah, it might be part of the elite's game plan. Maybe you push against the boundaries of reality so much you break the thing. That's possible. But I guess for the individual, I see Gnosticism as pretty empowering, though I think you disagree because you're pretty hard on it in the book. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, I, re I respect your opinion a lot. I respect a lot of these anti-Christian opinions because I, I don't, you know, I practice mindful meditation. That's very important to me. I do a lot of practices that are considered sort of new age ideas because I think that on some levels there's areas where God gives us the power and the free will to sort of try to do better for ourselves, try to use the head, the, the brain that he gave us. And I think a lot of the Christian sort of churches out there, they, I don't know what it is, man. It turns into like people have this like cultish sort of weird perspective on it. They turn into, uh, you know, Kirk Cameron or whatever. So on some levels I get it, but to me, the short response, I give you a long response here, but the short <laughs> response is, and I'm no theologian, right? But from what I understand about Gnosticism is it's the inverted reality and that the real benefactor to humanity is Lucifer, is the serpent. Now, the long answer to that, and I put all the citations in my book, I use legitimate citations, legitimate sources, because I think this is important information to discuss, quite honestly, because I think that what we're facing here is a new religion. We're facing the establishment of the alien occult religion on Earth. And Dr. Diana Pasalka, you know, you interviewed her, I interviewed her, I read her book twice. It's a fantastic book. And I recite that often in this book because a lot of her ideas, to me, make a lot of sense. It really resonates. Mm hmm now, let's look at secret machines first. My argument is they're going to create a new religion. It's got to be based on the aliens and the occult and science and all that. The book is called Secret Machines. They replaced the C in secret with a K. Well, this is important in the occult because K is the number of magic. Aleister Crowley said this is the sacred number par excellence of the new aeon, the new age, right? And the new aeon of Horus is the age of the crown and conquering child. It's the one where man will pursue his own true will. That's where the, you know, do what thou wilt comes from. So to me, they're trying to start a new age. And we see this with a lot of, like they said, oh, you know, Saturn and Jupiter conjunction. We're facing the age of Aquarius. And, and they've been saying this for many years. They're slowly and over time creating this new religion. But to do the new religion, they need to first like I argue in the book with all these occultists who said, you got to get rid of Christianity first and foremost. They got to get rid of Christianity. They got to make us atheists. But man is a spiritual being. Man understands on some levels there's more to it than just this fluke of a, a you know, we're, we evolved from frogs in the sludge kind of thing. Man is a spiritual being. He will fill that void of atheism with a new religion of some sort. So they're prepping and they're paving the way for this new religion, which is based on science, quote unquote science. You know, they say, oh my God, there's a billion stars and a billion planets. The world is teeming 
with life everywhere and you know neil degrasse tyson out there when he's not you know sexually assaulting women he's out there oh my god there's so many aliens and bill nye oh my god there's so many aliens a guy who does i've got more scientific degrees than bill nye by the way i've got a master's degree in systems engineering and i've got more education than this guy (laughs) <laughs> and, and don't quiz me on science Boom. that's not my forte at the moment i i turned into one of those people that got the degree in basket weaving and did something else entirely but anyway uh-huh. i digress the point being they're like oh my god these scientists oh my god aliens everywhere and yet through the scientific method there's no observations of aliens anywhere they don't exist anywhere with the five senses so you got to take it to a spiritual component right that's why we need the spiritual element to this thing. That's why Dr. Diana Pasalka was consulted by these guys like Tyler, the anonymous Tyler, who take her out to the desert to a UFO crash site and they pick up pieces of UFO and say, look, this isn't a belief. This is real. I've been holding it in my hand. They need her to advise them on how to establish the new religion, which will consist of a pantheon of pagan alien gods. Hmm. And I'll try to be brief. I mean, we could talk all day. But Secret Machines, Secret with a K, that's a very important distinguishing change that they made. Look at the authors. Tom DeLonge and Peter LaVenda. Tom DeLonge, a Freemason goofball from Blink-182, which no offense to Tom DeLonge. I like Blink-182. But, you know, he's a Freemason. And if you've read any of Peter LaVenda's books, clearly Peter LaVenda wrote these books, Secret Machines. Peter LaVenda, very intelligent guy. He knows his stuff for sure. In one of his books, The Dark Lord, he asserts that he's never been a member of any of these ritual magic groups because online there's lots of claims that he's this person or that person. And it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, The guy's got great information. So when I read Secret Machines, I'm like, okay, Peter LaVenda wrote this book. Like this is clearly from him and not Tom DeLonge. Mm -hmm. And in Secret Machines, they're laying the foundations for the new religion and they First, I have to tell you that, well, Gnosticism might be the more accurate religion than Christianity, per se. And to me, my understanding of Gnosticism, like you mentioned, is kind of an inverted reality. God the Father, here's this oppressive guy in the clouds with a beard, and he's like, look, I'm going to make some humans to sit around and worship me, and I'm going to give them this long laundry list of rules, and if they violate any of them, I'm sending them right to hell. I think George Carlin does a really great skit on that, which which is very funny, talking about, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and don't forget, I love you, you know, and it's like funny. Right. But, you know, the Gnostic version of reality is like, look, we're prisoners on this prison planet in this material prison, this skin prison cell, and our spirits, they need to be released. They need the freedom, which can only come from the serpent, from the liberator in the Garden of Eden. Uh, And it was a Gnostic teaching that Adam, he didn't fall asleep and fall from grace. He fell awake. He was being enlightened from the serpent at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because the serpent told him you can be like gods. Because again, that's another consistent theme you see in these occult teachings is man can become God. And, you know, to its extreme end, you've got people like, What's his name? Applewhite, who ran the Heaven's Gate cult, another UFO nutty cult, and they Mm -hmm. all thought they could become gods. That's why they all put on the Nikes and drank the Kool-Aid or whatever. Right, right. But let me try to wrap this up. This can be a long, windy conversation. But, you know, Parsons, he, he said, look, I'm the Antichrist in the Gnostic inversion. That means he's the new God. Not to say he's the new Christ, but like the inverted principles the Antichrist, the Lucifer, the serpent, those are the true benefactors to humanity, really saving mankind from the oppression that comes with the Christian faith, which Jack Parsons, he was really into the sex, you know what I mean? And he thought that when he did the Babylon workings with L. Ron Hubbard out there in the desert, they were trying to manifest a female goddess of Babylon. Mm-hmm. And the result was of course marjorie cameron and i did like a three-part show on her she's a fascinating person but anyway she appeared as the consort as the manifestation of energy in crowley's aeon of horus and they were supposed to bring about the moon child this was supposed to bring about the religion of the antichrist and i've got a quote here 
and the purpose was to unleash Babylon's licentious spirit on a populace tyrannized by Christianity's strangulating attitude towards sexuality, seen by Jack Parsons as the underlying root cause of psychological torment and societal bigotry. And they thought bringing Babylon about would trigger spiritual Armageddon and destroy all the monotheistic gods. So to zoom it back out, I think that they're laying the foundations for people to accept the Gnostic perspective, which is an inverted reality, so that they say, oh, you know what? You're right. Christianity is oppressive. And I'm not here to argue that it's not. It doesn't have a good track record, okay? But that's where they want to take this. And ultimately, like I always say, it's like, you know, choose your own reality. Like, (laughs) I don't care what people do. I just want them to understand and know the information so that they can make the right choice for themselves. Like if you want to jump on board the UFO cult and worship Lucifer, like knock yourself out. Like it doesn't bother me any, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like yes. I, I'm, I'm from the perspective of like, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. You know what I mean? Like someday I'm going to die and my soul is going to go to another, you know, hopefully into heaven if I'm being a good little Christian boy, you know, <laughs> but you know, I just think the information isn't very clear cut. And I think there's a lot of deception along the way. Yes. Well, that I totally agree with. And that's what makes it so hard is because there's deceptions at various depths that are well beyond our lifespan. So it's hard to really pick an era and say, okay, this is where I think uh, there was the least amount of deception. And this is the paradigm I'm a part of. But it is those age old questions. Does technology free us or does it take us further away from what it is to be human? It's hard to say until the technology is fully implemented. Uh, There's a lot of technology I think we would support and has probably saved a lot of lives. But it seems where the technocracy is taking us is a dark path. It's also the age old question of ignorance is bliss. I have friends. I'm sure you have friends who go to work, do their little nine to five, come home, have some beers, watch the baseball game, and they don't get into conspiracy. And they're happy, but they're ignorant. And to wake up to that, to wake up to the big game is not comfortable. You know, obviously, I think we have some sleepless nights, but at the same time, I choose that over being ignorant. If the world is structured like a slaughterhouse, do you want to know or do you want to just chew cud and be ignorant of it until the day of your slaughter? It is a philosophical question, you know, that you have to decide. So I am on the side of of being woke to a degree. And maybe that makes me some kind of Gnostic, but really the exploration of consciousness and ether physics and intention healing has all made my thoughts about God and nature stronger and more positive. And in my opinion, the elite have been chasing these things and trying to craft controllable, digital, simulated versions of them. And yes, that is where we get transhumanism. To me, the promises of transhumanism are the false god in the sense that we already can train our consciousness to explore the quantum realm or the Akashic record for insights, but they want to plug us into a digital internet. We already are eternal beings of unlimited potential, but they want to trap your soul in the meat suit eternally because this is the dimension they control. They want to make us afraid of death, but the right out-of-body experience lets you know that that's nothing to be afraid of. Of course, They want to, quote unquote, free the soul and put it right into a digital husk or free consciousness right into the binary ones and zeros of some satellite system that they can shoot off into space. So I read your book and I think that you're very right about the goals and machinations of the elite, but you lump in what I consider abilities in the natural world, gifts from God, we might even say. And the elite's play, in my opinion, is to make cold, dead, digital, cyber simulation analogs to these very things that they've convinced us don't even exist. So that's the game is like, there are quote unquote technologies of the mind that are gifts from God in this reality. The first step is to tell us none of that's real and to make us atheists, as you say. And then the next step is to roll in their simulated versions, their digital versions of all this stuff. And so that's that question. Going back to does technology free us or take us away from what it is to be human depends on what kind of technology you're talking about. 
You know, that's, I guess, the way I would frame it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think that technology is a gift and a curse at the same time. I'm not like a Luddite where I'm anti-science, anti-technology. I mean, clearly we're speaking over great technology right now, which is used to open minds. But this same technology can be used to destroy minds and keep people ignorant. You know, people consume hours out of their day watching social media and getting into fights with people and all that stuff. Now, the cryptocurrencies is a good example of this, right? I think, because I did a lot of research on the cryptos, ultimately I came to the conclusion eh, about a year or two ago, I came to the conclusion that cryptocurrencies, they were originally a path to freedom from fiat currencies and the banking system. Because the big difference between cryptos and your traditional putting cash inside of your, you know, digital cash, digital dollars inside of your bank is a trust system. You put your trust in the bank that your money will be there and all your transactions will go down as, as they say they will. But in the cryptocurrency world, it's got a blockchain, which is this ledger that, you know, everyone can look at. Everything's transparent. Right. You don't need trust because it's right there in front of you. But to me, like this sounds good in theory, but in practice, from what little bit I messed with cryptocurrencies, that wasn't the reality. For example, I had the Coinbase app, which again, funded by a lot of these like elitist type folks that required me to upload a driver's license. So like they want to legitimize cryptos to the point where you do need to verify your identity. It can't be that anonymous. Okay. So they've kind of already perverted this thing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my argument has always been, because of the blockchain, let's say that your employer now wants to pay you through cryptocurrency. In all reality, they can trace and track every expenditure you ever make. Like this is a next level control. Whereas if my employer pays me with a paycheck and I cash that thing out, I could take those ones right to the strip club and nobody knows the difference. But with the cryptos, like this is full control, which is why you now see the World Economic Forum pushing for this stuff, which is why the Congress tried to push cryptocurrencies into the first stimulus bill because they wanted to track the expenditures. And again, it comes from this noble idea that, well, you know, we're taking taxpayer money and we're giving it to businesses. We got to make sure these businesses are doing the right thing with it, because if there's one thing I do know is that you can't trust corporate America. Uh, so the idea of technology, it's good on some levels because now cryptocurrency, you know, anyone with a cell phone and an internet connection can now have access to a bank, which sounds like not a big deal here in America, but like there's many third world countries that they don't have this sort of ability to do transactions like that. So it's going to be a big to do, but much like you know, speaking on technology and transhumanism, much like the health system and big pharma in America, they say, well, we got this virus. We're going to roll out this super fast. Uh, I don't know what terms I want to use. I don't want to get you in trouble. Stabby. We're going to roll the stabby real mm -hmm. quick and just hang tight, everyone. Wash your hands. And like the whole time I'm sitting here researching like the health stuff because I'm very interested in health and nutrition and i'm like well what they should be saying is lose 10 pounds don't eat fast food up your vitamin d all these things right these basic tenets that most people sort of understand but they don't drill that message home instead they drill home isolate yourself and wash your hands and all this stuff until we can come through with the stabby and it's always this universal sort of butcher knife approach to we got to fix everyone and everyone has to do the same treatment and everyone needs this butcher knife response instead of like a scalpel of, well, you know, it's really only these folks over here that really need the help. Let's focus on them. And that's where the digital matrix is going to come in because there's going to be a bunch of us, us truthers generally, I would say, that are not going to want to participate in this thing. But then you're going to have a lot of people that do that are like, Johnny football, they're watching the sports ball game, just wants to like drink beers with the boys on the weekend, not worry about conspiracy. Like 
he's going to be like, oh, cool. I don't have to like ever work again and I won't know the difference. <laughs> Sign me up, you know, and this is very much, you know, the philosophers have been covering this sort of idea with the evil genius brain in a vat experiments for hundreds of years. And, you know, we saw this in the Matrix films and all this. But to me, I don't trust it, man. I don't <laughs> trust this dogma of science. They want to pretend like, oh, we've got technology perfected. And I'm like, no, you don't, man. I got Bluetooth on my phone and half the time it doesn't hook in right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't trust you with my soul and consciousness. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. So many things are problem, reaction, solution, just like the two examples you gave. Cryptos, it's like, well, we have a shitty fiat currency system, so then we need a solution to it, and they usher in something shittier. It's the same with medicine. You know, that's why so many people think whatever COVID is, they probably created it, if not just with testing, then some other fashion, because it's a problem, it gets a big reaction, and then the solution makes us worse off than we were before. So yeah, I totally agree. So many things can boil down to that three-step process. And just getting back to your book a little bit while we're still in the first hour here as before we close it out, if you're right and these entities are closer to demons than anything else, what are the steps to this plan in their perfect world? If it all went according to plan, what exactly happens? They simulate some sort of mass reveal they develop technology to give the demons a physical body. They convince humanity to trust these beings. How do you see the steps rolling out? Well, I think that I go through a whole section on Project Bluebeam, right? And I think that was a pretty good example of how this thing might get laid out in front of us. And this is, of course, a lot of people are already familiar with Bluebeam, so I won't go through all the details, but the idea is. They want to get us into this new world order, this global government. And in order to do so, we need to reestablish the history of mankind. We need to sort of break down. This is an alchemical thing, right? You have to break down. You have to destroy. You have to dissolve, solve, and then coagulate. You have to rebuild. So they're going to have to sort of redefine all of mankind. And this is kind of already happening with like ancient aliens, right? These occult ideas of ancient alien visitation have already planted their seeds into the minds of the masses. In the last six years, there's been this full 180 degree flip of people that, you know, it used to just be us, Greg. It used to be people like us that was out there saying, hey, I think aliens exist. And we used to get made fun of. We used to get mm -hmm. shoved into the lockers, you know? <laughs> and now, <laughs> now, you're a fool if you don't believe that they're out there. You know, look, Joe Rogan said it. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson said it. They're out there. No offense to Joe Rogan. I love Joe Rogan. But they're redefining all of these sort of ideas we've had. And they're psychologically preparing us through entertainment, which is, again, a principle and idea behind a lot of these occultists. Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, Edward Bernays, all these guys were masters of the archetype and talking to the subconscious, and this is what the entertainment has been giving us, which is what I, I'm going to talk about in User Illusion 2 is specific films and stuff where they talk about this. Now, as the technology picks up, we're going to have the big space show in the sky where they're going to produce images of God to each culture, and these gods, these fake gods, are going to basically say, look, Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and all these guys, we're all actually emanations of the same source, it turns out. We're all the same truth. Like there's only one consciousness. It's this cosmic consciousness. And that's what's going to get people into the religion of the Antichrist, right? They think that this sort of deception of the masses through a fake alien invasion which runs parallel to the idea of actual aliens, but they're going to use this to get us into this global government. At least that's how the theory goes. And if you look at the history of the occult, they've been wanting this Luciferian, Antichrist, New Age, global agenda. They've been talking about the Maitreya, right? This is the, the ascended master. This is the source of all this enlightenment from the alien gods. This is in Helena Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, 
where she talks about the final age of the Kali Yuga. They talk about the stone of destiny, the Sirius as the hidden God. And, you know, this philosopher's stone, they're going to unite Western mysticism with the great work of the Freemasons. And all that to say that they want to bring about the apocalypse, that the Bible is read like a recipe book. They want to bring about the apocalypse and bring the Luciferian religion to the masses. And they're going to do this through various forms of technology, through 5G, Internet of Things, Elon Musk's Neuralink, you know, all these things, because they've been perfecting the manipulation of the human mind for dozens of years through MK Ultra, propaganda through Edward Bernays, all this stuff. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But that's the idea is that technology will be used to manifest the alien invasion. The question, the real question to me is, again, like what level of manipulation are they going to use to prove to us that aliens exist or to show us what they want us to believe? Like, Maybe both things simultaneously exist, and they're going to use this to try to retain power, to try to retain control. Because like you said earlier, we're basically putting our trust into the hands of the psychopaths, much like Klaus Schwab's Great Reset, this World Economic Forum. It's run by like the thousand biggest corporations or whatever. I'm not putting my trust in the corporate system. Like These are the guys that ruined it all, <laughs> and they want to sit here and say, well, now we got the solution for you. And it's just this downward spiral, if you ask me. Right. I totally agree. And it is hard to predict how these things will roll out. A lot of the things that COVID has implemented are things we've been warning about for a long time, but we didn't know what that trigger event would be. And I'm assuming there's some kind of trigger event or multiple trigger events in this rollout that will also surprise us. But when we see what it implements, we'll be like, okay, that is what I was expecting. I just didn't know how we were going to get there. There's, there's little parts of the story that have been yet to be filled in. And when you're talking about these four steps that will push the New World Order's desire to have this New Age religion through Bluebeam, which is largely being uh, controlled by NASA, you say, like, the first one of these you define as engineered earthquakes and hoaxed discoveries. Okay, well, what, what would be an example of a hoaxed discovery here? Is this kind of like what... Diana Pasolka was shown in the desert. She's taken out to the desert and they're like, oh, these metamaterials, they just emerge out here. And then, oh, look, we found one. Like, is that a simulated or hoaxed discovery or are you talking about something else? Yeah, that's a good question because we live in an age of sort of like a post-fact age where people kind of believe what they want to believe at this point. There's no, there's no amount of evidence to make people believe in one thing or another. The examples I would provide, NASA, back when I wrote The Dark Path, the chief scientist said they will prove to mankind that extraterrestrials exist by the year 2025. Now, how do they know that, right? How do they know that that's going to happen? Like, they've been trying to make contact for many, many years. How did she know that? Well, they've got various missions, lots of sticks in the fire. They've got the Europa Clipper mission. And in this last year, we've seen a lot of ideas. They've been floating around, like Hubble found water vapors on the moon or whatever. And I believe, was it called Osiris Rex? I think it's called. It's like a mission where they're putting a probe onto an asteroid for the purpose of trying to find bacteria. And they're going to bring that back in 2023 and analyze the bacteria. And the whole purpose of Osiris Rex, which again, it ties into your pagan Egyptian gods thing with Osiris, the god of the sun there. The whole purpose of that is to prove that panspermia is a potential option for the origin of the human species, that we basically came here on an asteroid as a form of bacteria. And it just so happened that Earth had the right conditions for man to evolve and become homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be doing stuff like that. And look, I'm no, I'm no NASA scientist. Like, if they come back and say, look, we found this bacteria, this proves panspermia, like, I mean, all I got is to sit here and say I don't believe it. <laughs> How do you fact check that kind of thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have the answers for that. But to me, 
the clear thing is that they have an agenda and they are pursuing it. And this agenda will rely upon our dogmatic faith in science, which you see with all the events of 2020, shaming people that don't believe in science as the end all be all, which, you know, like we already talked about just a minute ago, it's to me, science isn't the end all be all. I think even Oppenheimer, the guy who created the A-bomb, I think he said some to the effect of science isn't the answer to everything, but it sure is beautiful, right? Hmm. And I think that's well stated by Oppenheimer there. <laughs> I'm intrigued by all of it. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I really do like the book you wrote. You have so many interesting details and threads in there and quotes that I didn't know. And regardless of conclusions, I mean, all that data is definitely well packaged and I really do appreciate it. Before we totally call it in, I know you've gotten a lot of other material out since we last talked and you did release a book largely made up of the best insights from your interviews and your podcast, something I've been trying to do for a long time, still haven't managed to do it. But maybe as we're wrapping up, tell the people a little bit about this book, a little bit more about the podcast you're doing, and anything else you got out there that they should know about before we call it a day. Yeah, there's a lot, right? Like, I stay pretty busy. <laughs> 2020 has been a crazy, wild year. The levels of what they call the Great Awakening seem to be the audience drawn to me just this year has been overwhelming and I'm trying to sort of keep up with all the ideas being floated. I'm trying to research all these things because as you alluded to, I've been running my podcast for many years and I didn't take it real serious until about 2018. And that's when I started sort of doing it more full time than previous to that. I used to do a lot of blogs and YouTube videos and, you know, you get banned from everything and you think, well, what's next? What can I do now? And podcasting was it. And I didn't even want to do podcasting. So I've been really, really going deep on the research. I've got many like multiple part episodes, like the Great Reset is a very important topic to me. I've been covering that on the podcast. The book, the Conspiracy Theories and Unpopular Culture, the book, like you said, it's kind of like I took sort of some of the more popular topics and, you know, you could listen to all the shows theoretically, but like I give it a written form where, you know, I go through a little bit of everything, a little hodgepodge mix of what's flat earth, do I believe flat earth, a couple of movie analysis like Truman Show, Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin, Illuminati bloodlines. I mean, it's kind of a greatest hits of all these ideas that I found to be kind of the most important questions that I get asked over and over. I wrote that book this year, and then I also wrote, I finished this alien book this year. Next year, I'm working on the second book, Use Your Illusion 2, so they can look out for that. But if the audience wants, and I want the audience to check out the reviews for this alien book, Use Your Illusion 1, they've been coming back very highly rated. Like, I'm humbled by this. I'm very, uh, very appreciative of this, but like, apparently, this is a real hit for a lot of people. Uh, yeah. So that that's a good thing for me. I'm very proud of that. But the book is available on Amazon. I self narrated it on Audible. It's flying off the freaking shelf. I, it was like number one in the UFO category above some of these, these greats, you know, above Whitley Strieber's new book, above Jacques Vallée's books. I mean, I'm like, dude, I don't, <laughs> on some levels, I'm like, I don't deserve this level of, of appreciation, but people really, it resonates. So that tells me that maybe I did hit on the nerve of something that could hold true here. So if people want the book, it's on Amazon, it's on Audible, and then I sell signed paperbacks on my Gumroad store, gumroad.com backslash Isaac W. And then, you know, if some of the people want, if they're not ready for that level of commitment, they can follow <laughs> me on Instagram at Isaac Weishop. Another option, I've got a deal where you can get four books for $5. All you got to do is sign up for my email newsletter on IlluminatiWatcher.com. I will send you my first book, which I'll admit when I read my first book again, I think Ugh, my writing wasn't that polished, but you know, whatever. It, it's actually very relevant content talking about the Illuminati and ancient aliens and pop culture. They can go to my Gumroad store to get another free book. And then if they sign up for my Patreon for five bucks a month, you know, just do it for one month and bail. If you get The Dark Path, which is like my most popular book, hundreds of ratings and reviews on that. And you get that Kubrick's Code book with the two and a half hour 
video I made for that where I got clips from the movies and, and I go through the whole thing with you. <laughs> yeah, that Kubrick's Code stuff is really, really great. I am happy that I now have the Use Your Illusion Part 1 book signed to put right next to my signed copy of Kubrick's Code if I ever find a DVD player again. I think those days are gone. <laughs> but it, it's yeah, still excellent. really great work, and this was a lot of fun. I know these are heavy times, and this high strangeness category is definitely in the mix of things, even if it might not feel as pressing as the lockdowns or the financial aspects of the Great Reset. But a lot of these things are coming out of the woodwork more now than ever, so it's interesting to try to figure out what they're up to. And your book does a great job of trying to get to the heart of it, so keep at it. Great to talk to you again, man. You're one of the good ones. Take care out there. Yeah, right on. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. It's like this and like that and like this, ladies and gentlemen. My friend and yours, <laughs> Isaac Weishaupt. Always a conversation I enjoy. The sort of non-political subject matter that we can push and pull on a bit. Obviously, we have different opinions on a few things, but we're both pretty open-minded, I like to think. And it seems like the sort of stuff where the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And different schools of thought, different philosophical compasses, they don't mean the same to an individual as they would to an elite Satanist cabal. Find me a philosophy that the billionaire predator class couldn't warp and twist until it seemed evil. Though we have heard a lot of guests describe the elite belief system as some sort of techno-gnostic cult. I wouldn't deny that, but to me, Gnosticism could be considered a philosophy for ambitious individuals who want to take control of their lives in an oppressive system and enjoy the adventure of seeking the deepest truths, no matter how difficult they might be. But that same philosophy, scaled up to a billionaire level, is going to look so much different. I mean, do you and I think about ambition the same way Bill Gates does? <laughs> Probably not. And I would probably clarify also that I don't think the physical world is a prison. I think it's a playground that the elite have worked really hard to turn into a prison, probably at the behest of some archonic mind parasites drunk on blue blood power players, moving them around the grand chessboard as they see fit. But it can feel like a prison, because we're born into this world with no memory of the non-physical dimension, so when we get glimpses of it through various techniques, or we take the right substances and dive into that dimension of pure love, it feels like we're missing something. Like we're stuck in this heavy, dense, physical reality, and there's an eternal oneness right on the other side of the veil that we can't reach. Well, you can't reach it right now. You're doing something else. That is sort of the irony, that part of the memory you don't have is that you were there, and you wanted to be here. You wanted to play in the sandbox. You wanted to taste chocolate and see the Grand Canyon. And fuck. But we have villains here, too. And that's as exciting as it is very frustrating. Our enjoyment of the sandbox is severely hampered by so many things, chief among them this green paper that must be exchanged to do anything. In this world, we deal with deception and misdirection and hijacked pleasure centers by insanely sophisticated marketing departments and behaviorist think tanks. But just because we have bullies in the sandbox doesn't make reality itself something to be bitter about, which is a criticism of Gnosticism because a lot of times those folks can seem quite bitter about being in the physical plane, period. Besides, with a little mental discipline or a lack of sobriety discipline, you can get a taste of home anytime you want. But it's all fun to talk about and think about. Broadly, I think Isaac and I do have the same attitude that this shit is interesting, but we're always going to be outside analysts. There's always going to be pieces we aren't privy to, and the puzzle will always probably be partially incomplete. That's what makes it fun and interesting. But as it relates to the last episode, sometimes you do have to come up for air. I don't know why 
some people can digest really deep and heavy things and kind of keep it light and others let it define them. I don't know. It is funny, though, when conspiratorial content comes up, it's so often coupled with that disclaimer, but don't get obsessed with it. As if obsession is healthy in any regard. Sure, there are levels. Your obsession with The Bachelor probably isn't going to get you fired from your job, like some obsessions would. But even with my conspiratorial interests, I'd rather at least try to be a well-rounded person. Anyway, big thanks again to Isaac. He did write a very intriguing book of high quality. It was so much fun to talk to him about it. The first hour was great, but that second hour, of course, went to some pretty high heights as well. For those who just listened to the first free hour, you're missing quite a bit. Become a Plus member already and treat yourself. You don't have to do it forever, but just dip in for a month or two, throw me a couple of bones, and hear the second half of these conversations you're already listening to an hour of. In this particular one, we talked about the prospect that panspermia could be part of the path of accepting alien gods. And probably my favorite topic of the day, the question of if developments in the AI arena could actually be alien life. Think about us projecting our consciousness out and then having that be recovered and developed as AI on another planet. This could be the alien god. Think about what Chris Bledsoe said. But it is so likely that a civilization's technology would have further reach through the cosmos than their physical bodies. And to have someone on another planet recover that technology, very provocative, very provocative. We also talked about Hollywood manifestation in the ET agenda, the Collins elite, UFOs in hell, and the invitation, so to speak, Bigelow, Antimanium Holdings, and the Skinwalker Ranch sale, and that deep dark thread that gets into the overlap between those accused of child abuse and those with alien interests. When it comes to the big club, there is a much greater overlap there than anyone should be comfortable with. But in terms of a good conversation, I loved it. I am really intrigued by what Hollywood could achieve by capturing the attention of so many minds and seeding them with certain images and ideas. Really, that is Isaac's bread and butter. But when I think about it, it comes back to that sandbox idea. In the basic design... There is no mechanism to access hundreds of millions of mines across the planet. So when one is built, and then some films are crafted by some people who study the effects of symbols and ideas on the subconscious, and they have that kind of reach, it starts to get really interesting. What can that tool really do? How much do filmmakers even know about the tool they're wielding? And which one of them is using it for which purpose? I like wrestling with these questions, largely because I'm such a pop culture junkie. And it makes me feel like I was just doing years of research to get to the bottom of really important questions rather than just vegging out, watching three or four movies back to back. But the more we know about manifestation and influence combined with this global reach, it makes you think. But another thing that crossed my mind with all this is that when you look at old material that would prophesize our current era or that magical, mystical year 2000, it was all Jetsons flying cars and robot assistants and zipping around on jetpacks. Those old 50s and 60s depictions of our time with the automatic sidewalks everywhere, they didn't manifest despite them being heavily implanted in the minds of so many just a generation or two ago. What does that say about demonic space beings? I don't really know. Then you see the Space Force using a logo from a fictional sci-fi show, and the government decides to call them Guardians of the Galaxy, and it seems like they're trying to siphon off a little energetic juice from some of the biggest franchises in sci-fi history. It's a curious thing. We could talk about it all day, but thanks for listening. Thanks for spreading the word. I've been pushing pretty hard lately. 
to throw a few more logs on the growth fire because I would hate to look back and think, well, you could have done more on the promotional side. Not my favorite part of the job, but thanks for making it easy because I appreciate the passion and the pollination and the fact that 99% of uh, the journey for me has just been word of mouth. So while you still can, share or talk about THC and it feeds the proverbial beast. A kind and gentle beast, of course, but that is it for me. Do check out IlluminatiWatcher.com. He's got a great website, a great podcast, and I'm happy to know him. I'm getting out of here. Your move, manifestation manipulators, alien disclosure architects, and openers of demonic dimensional doorways. Your fucking move. When you see weird lights outside of your door. Something sits on your chest when you sleep It might be a pattern you've been through before mm-hmm. Oh, you might have those screen memories Darling, wait till we get some proof Don't walk into the 